So it's very interesting times right now in the watch world. I mean, on one hand, you have some very positive and refreshing and new things. For example, this stainless steel AP 50th anniversary with the green dial. I mean, you know, these are nice things, something that's gonna give people something to look for or whatever, or grail, new grail pieces nowadays, you know? But then there's also some very odd things going on right now in the watch world, you know? For example, Omega's new releases. Yeah, we're gonna talk about Omega's new releases for 2022. So the first thing I wanna say is, I know that in a way the industry leader will say, okay, almost wanna say the benchmark of what other brands wanna follow is Rolex. I'm not saying Rolex is the best brand in the world or the most liked or maybe perhaps has the most models that you gravitate towards. But what I will say is, is that they do know how to market and how to maintain for years and years and generations a strong brand. Now, that being said, they've had some pretty good uh, calls in the last 10 years, which are pieces that for sure were gonna be hot and other trends we're gonna follow. However, I feel like the new latest releases of Omega were just, I don't know, almost unnecessary. Like, I understand, I get it. It's really hard to get right now a Rolex and they're gonna capitalize for whoever wants to do the next best thing. I could understand that market. I could understand there's gonna be a demand and I could understand that they're probably gonna sell them all out, especially when you don't have to wait any waiting list. Even though how ironic will it be <laughs> if there was a waiting list for these Omegas? But what I don't understand is why. I would say that Brand preservation is one of those things that should be used or at least some type of like brand pride. Like, can they innovate a little bit more and not do exactly the same thing? The first ones I wanna talk about is the Omega Aquaterra lineup. I mean, have you guys seen it? It's like almost a splitting image of the OPs. I get it, they're not the only ones that have watches with colorful dials. You can walk down the mall to one of those kiosks and buy a watch for $15 with any color dial you like. But a brand like Omega, which I don't know, man, I guess I just kind of held Omega on this certain bracket. I felt like, I don't know, I felt like it was a serious watch brand and I still do think it's serious, okay? I'm just questioning what's going on. But then again, <laughs> we did just have a Tiffany dial 5711 after we were supposed to have the final edition with the green one. So I guess at this point, it's just like anything goes pretty much, you know? I had mentioned through my social media, my harsh critique about these new Aquaterras that have the same exact color look at them. I mean, if you put it right next to each other, it's like this photo right here. It's like, it's almost the same lineup. You know, it's almost the same exact lineup. I had mentioned jokingly that I'm surprised they didn't come out with a Tiffany color dial one and, uh, yeah, we'll be talking about that in a little bit also as well. But anyways, those were not the only lineups that they came out with. They also came out with another four, or shall we say blessed us, with four other models that are pretty much spitting images of Rolex lineups. So I think at that point, since Omega had already committed to just Say, hey, if we can't beat them, join them. Let's just copy them. They came out with this genius right here, ultra deep. Yes, my friend, it's not a deep sea. It is an ultra deep. So let's go ahead and let's just name it one more crazier notch above a deep sea with the ultra deep. Very similar looking watch, of course, you know, with the transitioning dial that goes from dark to blue. Uh, but, you know, since we're going to name it ultra deep, let's just go ahead and make it go down to... 20,000 feet, you know, so that way they can't say we exactly copied them. They can say that we beat them. Yes, I think it's a marvelous engineering feat and uh, I'm not gonna knock on that at all. But, you know, maybe if we would have just dropped this one, I kind of would have been like, okay, it, it's not too bad. But then from there we go to another fan favorite right here, which we have the Seamaster in all green, which again, I know, they're not the only ones that have done this before, but yeah, maybe let's come up with something that perhaps the watch world will give it a really cool nickname, you know, maybe something like the Hulk or something. 
you know, again, uh, I don't think it's a bad looking watch. I like it. And if anybody wants one, I think they should buy it. But I think the timing is what makes it look a little bit awkward or more said, the fact that they did it all at once. Okay. It's just like no shame. Let's just bring out the Omegas just like Rolex. The next one I'm going to show you as it gets deeper is bam. Look at that right there. What do we have there? We have a rose gold speedy with a panda dial. Okay, fine. Maybe that one is the least one that I would critique because, you know, that's kind of a combination that they have had before. You know, they did have previously a speedy that looked very close to a stainless steel panda. Not a problem. Let's go ahead and add an Oyster Flex, you know, rubber strap on it. So it's kind of got the same look, you know, what I'm noticing right now on a trend as we've looked at these four models so far is that they went straight for the juggler. They whipped out the Rolex playbook and said, let's go for the watches that are the hottest sellers of each one of the lineups. And that way we should have a victory, you know. I don't see how it won't work, honestly. I think it will work. In one way, it's kind of shameful. On the other hand, it's genius because they just pretty much said, no shame in the game. We're gonna rip the top five models that are selling the most and we're gonna market them and we're gonna give somebody a second option because contrary to belief, I mean, I don't agree with all of this of waiting lines and having to do all of that. I, I've been selling watches since way before all of this, okay? I used to sell people watches under retail, brand new. Yes, there were times that that used to happen. We're not there anymore. I mostly like to sell pre-owned, to be quite honest with you, I think you get a better deal. But that being said, now, if you don't wanna wait for a Hulk or you can't get a Hulk no more, or you don't wanna wait for a James Cameron Deep Sea, just go to Omega, walk in, and instant gratification because that's the world we live in nowadays. Everything is instant gratification. But let's go ahead and wrap up these releases with the final one, which for me is the banger of them all. Let's get a rose gold speedy, great looking watch by the way, and just go ahead with a green dial. I mean, shit, maybe John Mayer might even feature it on his next video, you never know. I mean, again, I think that the biggest thing to me was the fact all of them at once, almost like they could have trickled them in and it might have gone below the radar, but there's no shame in the game. But can someone please explain to me what is going on with the moon swatch? So the moon swatch, okay, not moon watch, appears to be a collection, probably limited of course, all that, that appears to have one watch for every planet in our solar system. In theory, I think it might be actually pretty cool if somebody wanted to collect the whole collection and have it in their case. Guys, I don't have nothing against Swatch, okay? I used to collect Swatch myself when I was about eight years old. Way back then, they were pretty expensive. The original Swatches, the real skinny ones with the plastic band, I love them. I think they were a hit and it's one of those watches that dominated the watch world in that era. However, I don't really understand the need and uh, sorry if I'm ranting about it, it's because I care about Omega, contrary to what everybody else at home might think. Uh, I do care about the brand Omega and uh, their reputation. And I'm just wondering why would they make, boom, it's almost like the same thing as that Tiffany Dow 5711 with the LVMH in the back. Not sure I like that too much. Wasn't very happy, but anyways, so they came out with one watch for each planet in the solar system. That will make it 11 watches. And the crazy part about it is the array of colors. On one hand, it's kind of nostalgic for me because it does have that swatch plastic colored, you know, textured look to it, which I get it. I also want to point out that of all the variations in this lineup, how ironic is it that the Tiffany blue colored version says in the back, mission to Uranus. I mean, I'm just, I, I can't with this right now. The one thing that I do like about this collaboration is that it's going to be affordable. With the quartz swatch movement in the watch, it's gonna make it that much more for the guy that maybe wants to get into the game and can't afford a mechanical Omega Speedmaster. 
However, the way the game is going right now, I'm gonna go ahead and say that these watches are gonna go over retail. And that's the one thing I don't agree with. So it goes back to the beginning of the video. We are living some strange times right now in the watch world. And I can only hope to see what we're gonna see next for 2022. Oh yeah, and uh, I almost forgot to mention the fact that they went full Hublot on us and did an entire Tiffany colored ceramic Speedy. I'm like at a loss of words. I never saw the day would come where Omega would make a Speedmaster in Tiffany blue or something close to Tiffany blue nowadays because you know how that goes. Tiffany probably has a patent on that color, but a little bit disappointing. So please comment below what do you think about these Omegas if you agree with me or you don't. And if you like this video, like and share it. Also, subscribe to my new YouTube channel.